Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get awesome people focused on science, tech, and the future. Today we've got Alex Alex Reich on the program. He's the co-founder of Minute Earth and a couple of other really influential YouTube channels. Thanks for coming today, Alex. Thank you for having me. It's good to chat. So I wanted to start, there's a lot of things to talk about, but I heard you had a transformational trip to Iceland, and I thought that would be a good place to begin. Ooh, uh, well, I've been to Iceland twice, um, most recently on a New York Times student journey where I was a, uh, one of the leaders of the group um, where I got to go take a bunch of U.S. high school students to try to understand and, and experience climate change from uh, the perspective of a small Arctic island nation that's experiencing a lot of the impacts of climate change and that's also uh, doing a lot of good work to fight climate change through a lot of um, geothermal and renewable energy um, programs. And so that was one experience. And then prior to that, which I, the, the experience I think you're actually talking about more specifically, is that I spent a year in the entire Arctic, um, mostly not in Iceland, on what was called a Watson Fellowship, which was a, a year of basically like a Fulbright with no strings attached, where I got to basically try to understand something that I wanted to learn about the world. And what I was interested in was trying to understand how climate change was impacting the lives of Arctic indigenous peoples and how they're adapting to those changes. And the twist was that the lens that I was using was through food. So how how were their harvesting? How was their hunting? And how was their um, herding of reindeer changing as a result of these climate changes? And what did you find? So. The everyone always asks me that question, and it's a relevant question. But I think the way that I conceived of the opportunity that I had was that, and the way it was framed was that it was not, it was one of the few times in life that you could have an experience where you didn't have to do it for the outcome. It was purely, I the idea was it purely was a transformational experience for the participants, and that. If you are thinking the entire time about how to represent something, you have a very different experience. Just like how if I'm going to go for a walk and enjoy the snowflakes that are falling down or the beautiful colors of the leaves, I'm going to enjoy that. But I'm going to feel very differently about it and maybe not enjoy it or take the same thing out of it if I'm trying to think about how I'm going to Instagram or Facebook or tweet it. Um, I'll get something different out of it, but it won't necessarily be as fundamental. I um, mean, you see a lot of people today in society are turning away from the social media sort of environment that we have because it prevents us from getting into that depth. And so this experience was 100% about getting into that depth. And so I didn't actually try to have a scientific hypothesis that I was going to prove or disprove. I was just going as a person who didn't know a lot about it to try to experience what life was like for these people living where they lived under this changing climate. And so I don't have any takeaways that are particularly um, revealing in terms of uh, hypothesis, but one thing that I did go into it with um, was kind of the analogy of how a person who wants to become a doctor might go volunteer in a place that has poor medical conditions or, you know, see how there is suffering and how medicine can help such that they get galvanized to spend their entire career working on helping people. They see what's bad, they get galvanized. And I kind of thought like, oh, I've heard that climate change is happening fastest in the Arctic, it's the front lines, whatnot. And people are really getting, you know, impacted in a negative way. And so I'm going to go there and have, see how bad this is. And that'll sort of really catalyze me to spend a lot of my time or my entire life working on this big issue. And to a certain degree, that was true. There were huge impacts that I saw, um, not only from climate change, but from a lot of things. But the, the biggest takeaway that I had from the year was that the people who I spent time with had were, were all descendants of people who had lived in those same places for thousands of years. They were the original inhabitants of the Arctic. And the Arctic is not an easy place to live. And the fact that, they've been, they, that their ancestors and they were able to survive for such a long time is a testament to their ability to survive and to, to adapt. And so basically the refrain that I heard was, we've, we've changed throughout time in order to be able to survive. And we're just gonna keep on changing and surviving now. And people have the added benefit of being a part of modern society, having 
gasoline, having houses, having guns, that kind of thing that makes can make life easier. Um, but that same fundamental sort of we can survive, we've been here, we're going to adapt was a really important lesson because I victimized these people in my mind and that was not necessarily how they saw themselves. And I think it's kind of a, a good analogy for the entire world where if we think that we are gonna be able to solve this, we are gonna be able to solve this. If we think that we're not gonna be able to, we won't get ourselves together to do it. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Exactly. What, when did climate change become on, come on your radar? It's been, it's been seemingly a driving force for you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think probably the first few instances of it were my grandparents who spent a lot of time in the Arctic talking about the changes they'd experienced and the fact that back when they were in the middle of their lives, they had heard about this concept um, and that we really hadn't been doing about anything about it. And now it was actually becoming much more of a known thing. You know, it's pretty remarkable that we didn't actually know what climate change or global warming was until a lot of research went into it. And a huge amount of research has gone into it. And we know an incredible amount about it now. Um, but the the first time I learned about it was sort of from, from my grandparents and my father basically saying, you know, this was a, we thought this was a thing a long time ago and it for sure is now. And you decided to make that your mission? <sighs> sort of. I have also had a fascination my, my bigger fascination and driving interest in life is trying to understand the broader relationship that humans have with the rest of the natural world around us, sort of what that means about what it means to be human, what it means about how we can survive, what it means about how we influence the rest of the world that we live on or other planets, um, other worlds. Um, and I think my most personally passionate and satisfied by thinking about that in the context of food. And so this trip to the Arctic was a, a perfect combination of sort of food, climate change, indigenous and, you know, indigeneity and um, also experience out on the land because I love being outside and um, interacting with a physical place through my physical body. Um, and so I would say that actually my, my largest driving interest is this question of how do we relate to the rest of the world? around us and I've, I've pursued sort of two main paths to understanding that and to, to learning more about that. And that's through food and then it's also through climate change. And those are obviously really, really tightly linked because the way that we farm and eat in deforest for farming is a huge part of the, the uh, impact that we have on our planet, including for climate change and climate change impacts all of those. Um, but the food related issues um, are not necessarily quite as dire or time bound as um, global concentrations of greenhouse gases are for, um, for humanity. It's a much longer story. Do you see the article that came out recently? The ozone seems to be repairing itself somewhat. I did, I think I did. Um, and I think the, the context in which I saw it was, but also China is putting a lot more ozone back into the atmosphere. And so um, I can't speak particularly about the, that finding. Okay. I was, I was just curious. I know you're very up to date when it comes to a lot of the, a lot of the science. Speaking of when and why did you start Minute Earth, uh, the YouTube channel with 2 million plus subscribers? It's one of the biggest, it's got to be one of the biggest science ones to date. Yeah, thanks. Uh, they're definitely um, a huge set of our peer channels these days, which is really, really exciting. Um, our, so the way that Minute Earth came about was essentially that um, while, I, while I went off into the Arctic, um, my brother had, who had studied physics in college and grad, college and grad school? I think college and grad school at that time, he, um, basically had had a long interest in film throughout his life as well and kind of was at the right place at the right time where his skills and knowledge and capabilities and interests merged really well into this burgeoning online educational 
YouTube space um, that related to science. And so he started a YouTube channel called Minute Physics from our the basement of our childhood home. And um, I sort of watched that grow as I was traveling. And my dad watched that grow as he he's a university professor who actually researches climate and other things. Um, and we both thought, well, that's really cool to use this plat that, you know, he's discovered, my brother's discovered something good about this platform and has a good way of um, telling these stories. Let's see if we can make something like this happen that is about the earth, the, the earth, excuse me, because physics matters, uh, or, excuse me, because physics is interesting, but the earth matters also is kind of the way that I've, I've thought about it. And so um, my brother, Henry was very interested in this as well because he's he's also very uh, passionate about uh, the earth and climate and having people understand how it works. And so we came together and um, a bunch, a, a number of other really, really impressive creators came together and sort of started Minute Earth. Um, I say, you know, you could say it started from anywhere because we all have always lived in remote remote from each other, not not anyone living in the same place. Um, and so I, you know, I would say that I started it, my role in starting it was from a couch in Chicago. So um, it's, in, it's interesting, you're making the world smaller while also seeing that the world is smaller because you can work from anywhere. Yeah. And it's it's actually kind of an interesting point because a lot of the people who create digital content that is meant to be seen or consumed, if you will, from around the world remotely are based in the same place, have a joint office where they all work together. And we've never have had that. And so it's it's kind of interesting because we are in, I think not, not a remarkably common uh, instance of people being far apart and creating things together, which is kind of like what this is too. So the channel has been really successful. What have been a couple of your favorite videos or topics? <sighs> it's a good question. Um, so to me, we've had this tension the entire time of whether the purpose of it is to tell stories that are interesting to us that reveal something about the way the natural world works, or to try to do that with a, an additional layer on top, which is trying to change the way that people think for some particular purpose, like you know, trying to catalyze action on climate change or reduce deforestation or get people to think about, you know, the role of honeybees in agriculture and maybe we should, you know, protect them or something. And so for me coming at it from the like, let's try to use this platform to catalyze positive out of body changes as opposed to just inside of brain. Now I've learned this thing and I move on kinds of changes. Um, the most, uh, the videos that I like most are those that are very intentionally focused. So we had a video before COP21, the big climate um, meeting a couple of years ago, where we said, you know, how climate change impacted us on the Minute Earth team. And I, I really enjoyed that video. It was very different than our just pure explanation type videos, which are our normal videos. Um, and we had a video in the one of the Democratic debates for president in 2016 uh, about climate change. And so YouTube had asked us basically if we wanted to submit a video that would be shown and, um, and then a question would be asked to the candidates. And that was about climate change. And that was one of the few instances where climate change featured in that uh, election cycle, um, which was a pretty cool thing because we've, we've ignored what you could say is the globe's largest issue in, you know, in America's largest sort of uh, stage for a very long time. Um, more so, than ignored it, we've pushed it away. We've made it disappear. Yeah, yeah. Does that how how worried are you about that? The U.S. pulling out of the Paris Accords, the EPA taking climate change off the websites. It's a good question. I try to insulate myself as a self preservation method from the ins and outs of daily. Um, attacks on things I believe in and think are um, valid. And so I have not followed as closely the exact nature of all of these things. Um, but obviously I do, I do know what, what's going on and 
I think it is highly problematic because without good information, it's very hard to make good decisions. And so the fact that the, um, the current administration um, is trying to laughable is trying to erase climate change from um from either from the public consciousness or from the agenda i think that's really problematic um because just because we're not looking at it doesn't mean it's not actually happening and so you know if i'm on a train going towards a cliff or on in a you know car going towards a cliff and i close my eyes that doesn't make me any safer so we're still going to get there and we might get there faster because we won't put the brakes on. How does what you do in your channel affect that? I imagine you said you want to galvanize people, but there's been a bit of a debate. What's the debate about? Yeah, I mean, the so I actually have two channels. One is called Minute Earth, one is Minute Earth and one's called Hot Mess, which is a, a new show that I'll s explain a little bit more about in a minute that's focused completely about climate change and called Hot Mess. Um, but on Minute Earth, that debate is primarily about sort of whether what we're doing is um, sort of journalism where we're trying to have this um, neutral or pseudo neutral perspective, just trying to explain things or if we have or if, or if we have an agenda that is pro something um, that's other than information and i come from the i come from the perspective that every everybody has an agenda it's not that doesn't mean that it's a nefarious agenda but i have an agenda that i get up and i want to have breakfast and i want to you know, have the things i care about and i i want those things to be um i i, I based on my beliefs and my understanding of the world um that I think those are important for society at large to think about. And everybody has these. And some of them, I think, are more based on um, data than others. Um, and so in Minute Earth, it's, it's been this question of, can we make the most positive influence in the world? And do we want Minute Earth to be this thing that um, is explicitly trying to move forward an agenda that is not just scientific literacy and interest, but is also um, movement on environmental or other health related causes. And that's sort of been been attention um, with. And so with Minute Earth, we've we've actually done, I think, a lot less than we could um, have done um, to date with respect to moving the climate conversation forward. Um, I think we've made about 14 or 15 videos out of 160. So that's about 10% of our videos have focused on climate or energy. Um, but we've had as many, oh, go ahead. we've had as many or more videos focusing on poop um, and helping people understand the role of poop in the world and the function of the digestive system. And I think poop is fascinating. I'm working on a video about poop right now, but I think it is arguably a little bit less important than climate change. As a devil's advocate, though, you see a lot of people today, they're anti-science. There's an anti-science movement, which is just absurd in this day and age. People that don't believe in climate change, they believe the world is flat. I think, I think definitely I would prefer to be in that first camp of trying to create that impact directly. But I think even just creating basic scientific understanding with people has some of that effect, if not a decent percentage. Oh, certainly. It's all, it is all very valid and very important. And it's, it's a fun, I think it comes down to a question of whether, how many layers of things you are working on, you want to pile on, pile on what you're doing. You want to dive deeper into climate change where we're at now? Sure. But let me, let me answer this, your question in the context of hot mess um, first. So hot mess is a, is a YouTube channel funded by PBS digital studios. Um, and I make it, um, I'm part of the team that makes it along with uh, Joe Hansen, who has works with a team that makes a YouTube channel similar to Minute Earth that's called, uh, excuse me, that's called It's Okay to Be Smart. Um, and um, basically starting last Earth Day around in, in April, we started releasing a video every week or so that was specifically um, about climate change and how we can try to basically 
hope people move from, oh, I hear about this, I know it's a big problem and I'm depressed because I don't know exactly what I can do about it and I think we can't solve it to, okay, like, yeah, this is a big problem, but I'm gonna not actively avoid it or I'm actually actually actively gonna try to seek it out and see see what I can learn about it and see how what I can do about it can help. Um, and so with that, we've basically tried to um, talk about a lot of the major issues that relate to climate change um, in ways that are uh, relevant to our viewers, which are intentionally um, trying to reach American viewers, but um, because of YouTube's global nature, global. Is that primarily because Americans seem to be the only ones silly enough not to believe in climate change? That is to a large degree the reason. Yeah, it's not only Americans, there are other, other countries that have also, um, I mean, the entire world has lagged on what we could do, um, but Americans in particular have, the American politic has been very unable to make uh, large scale action that moves climate change act, um, sort of forward as an issue. Um, you know, I think the latest poll, 72%, I think of Americans um, think climate change is an important issue, um, which is much higher than it has been in past years. And I think to a large degree, that's because we're realizing people are getting hit by hurricanes or droughts or very extreme rainfall events that are helping them realize, oh, something is happening. I see it with my own eyes. Now I'm going to believe it, even though I didn't necessarily believe that it was happening when I only thought about it as happening in a foreign country, or I didn't necessarily want to believe it because it would impact the way that I, you know, reflect on the way that I live. Um, but it is going to mean that I have to change the way I live. I would rather just, you know, keep my eyes closed and hope that there's not actually a cliff that I'm driving towards. It would be interesting if they re-aired day after tomorrow, because while it is at an accelerated speed, suddenly you see a lot of the things that are happening in that movie happening in the world today. It wasn't as relevant then as it is now. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, accurate and inaccurate representations of climate change in the media. And you're right on that there's a, um, the, the environment into which any thing is said or any thing is made um, and released is as important as that thing itself in terms of what impact it has. Speaking of, are you worried you've built your platforms on YouTube? You're playing on someone else's playground? <sighs> yes and no. We've, we've worried over the years about if, if there is a way to diversify the way that we interact with and reach our audience. And we've done a small degree of that, but to some degree, we're just a very, very small player and and play on the platform that is most effective at doing the thing that we're trying to do. And so someday YouTube will probably be no more and the world will be very different then. And we'll have a lot of other things to think about in addition to how could we have these sort of two minute animated educational science videos reaching people. How many other 2 million subscriber YouTube channels are there? There can't be a ton. Um, let me look that up for you. Um, you gotta be what, at least top 100? Oh no, no, the, um, the way that the uh, internet works is that there are a lot of people on it. And so um, if I look up Minute Earth, we have, let's see, we have, we are the 3,724th most subscribed YouTube channel. Wow. So there's a lot of YouTube channels out there that have a lot of viewers um, and a lot of subscribers. And so when we started, we were kind of a little bit, you know, on the vanguard of these educational science videos and, um, now there are like a hundred similar types of channels to us and you could see that same thing happening um, across across YouTube where it has become 
the place I would say for meaningful and also not so meaningful um, content in a way that um, because it's kind of this sort of monopoly type thing, it's not a monopoly, but it's a place that lots of things happen. It's hard, it's kind of hard to think about what, um, where else we might put things. And we actually did a couple years ago um, have our videos also on a, on a different site that has since ended um, kind of as an experiment. Um, but I think one, one reason to get back to your question about whether I'm worried about it all being on YouTube is that one reason I'm not super worried is that YouTube actually has been very pro creator um, in its stance. So it has been very supportive of people who use the platform for different ends and has, there are people on the YouTube team who work with us to try to help us have the best experience and grow our audience. And so um, that has been, and, and the idea of having monetization, which has allowed, you know, 3,723 other YouTube channels to become larger than us or to be larger than us. Um, YouTube has always had this sort of, as far as I'm aware, uh, has for a very long time had this uh, revenue sharing agreement in a way that, say, uh, say Facebook has not. And um, I'm not going to get into Facebook too much, but if if all of our videos were on Facebook only, I would be very concerned. And it, Minute Earth wouldn't exist either. Because no, you don't want to date Zuckerberg because Zuckerberg doesn't play nice. It's a uh, it's a really interesting world. It, you guys have done incredibly well. What outside of climate change? What else are you most focused on? You said food, and I, I imagine you mean food security, general uh, general things. But get into that a little bit more. Sure. So, you know, with respect to food, I think about it in a very global sense. It's also something that everybody interacts with in a very personal way, and I'm I'm partially at you know I'm almost as fascinated with that as with the global question but I feel compelled to try to think about it at a global level because the summation of all those individual um, relationships to food and the need for food um, has resulted in these large scale um, impacts on the world. And, um, you know, I think the stat is that we use the entire area, an area equivalent to South America, is farm field and an area equivalent to all of Africa um, we use for pasture in the world um, for grazing of animals. And so that's that's one of our biggest, those are, those are some of our biggest land uses. Um, and so I think about it in these global scales. And so I've been most interested in the um, what you could call the demand side or the consumer side. In graduate school, I did a little bit of research on mitigating the problem of food waste and food loss, which is essentially where up to a third or a quarter of the food that we produce doesn't actually make it to a, a human to get eaten because of losses at a different point on the um, supply chain, whether it's on the field because so, some producer in, in the less developed country can't protect their crops from insects or whether it's in a wealthy country where I am served at a restaurant, a meal that is twice as large as I can actually consume and I don't really feel like taking it home. So I just let it leave it and it gets thrown out. Um, so I focus on that. And then I've also focused on meat consumption because um, as someone who's dabbled a little bit in, in sort of economic style thought, the social cost of meat is particularly high. Um, and if the social cost of certain types of meats in particular root from ruminants, which are animals that digest, um, have bacteria and archaea in their, in their rumens, which is like a multi-chambered gut or intestinal system, they produce a lot of methane and also are somewhat inefficient at digesting uh, well, they eat grass, which is which is hard to digest. And so as a result of that, they emit a lot of methane. And so I think 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from um, cattle or I think from cattle alone. And then another one to four or 5% come from um, other livestock. Um, 
I think, think it's I think it's more. I think animal farming is 38%. Yeah, I don't think it's that high because uh, I've done a fair bit of research into it, and I think that there's a um, there is a huge amount of oil and coal and gas that gets taken out of the ground and burned and is super carbon intense, and a lot of trees that get cut down that are also rich in carbon. And the amount of industrial activity that powers the society is. I mean, just I just mean just methane. Oh, methane. Um, no, not yeah. CO2. CO2 is much smaller percentage. Oh, yes. Yeah. So for methane, I it may be that um, that, yeah, what's called uh, the fermentation from uh, enteric fermentation from um, ruminants may be that high. It's crazy when you think about it. Are you excited? Uh, have you guys done any videos on clean meat? So we did a video uh, a number of years ago called How Much Does Meat Actually Cost? Um, which tried to break down some of the social cost to health or to the environment or to water um, of, of meat. And we haven't done anything about sort of lab-grown meat or, um, you know, plant-based protein, um, in part because it's a very... It's a very specific type of topic, and um, it's also been covered a lot. And um, I don't know. Perhaps we'll return to it someday. I think we may we may do that more likely on Hot Mess because it the the our hope with Hot Mess is to provide folks with a sense of solutions, and um, that's our very our central mission. And um, different types of meat um, could play a really important role in moving that 10% much lower. Oh, absolutely. I know I was watching one of the videos. It was great. It was about the 99% uh, DNA match between humans and chimpanzees. Can mm -hmm. you get into that a little bit more? Because I think it's fun for people to learn. Sure. So that was a video we made quite a while ago, um, I think called, Are We a Really 99% Chimp? And so we, um, we basically had a video that explored what it, what it means to be related to a creature um, or a or different organism and how we actually calculate that. Um, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what the, um, what the statistic was for um, how related we are to a banana, because I think we're like- It was like 60% or something yeah, crazy. Yeah, so um, comparing genomes isn't necessarily as useful as we think it is or doesn't mean exactly what we think. So yes, their video we said 50% of our DNA is shared with bananas, 80% is with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. And so we are more related to chimps than we are to those other um, organisms, but you couldn't necessarily um, like you know, take 99% of my body and, you know, chop off my hand and then uh, put a chimpanzee hand on it or, you know, chimpanzee brain on my, uh, in my head and have it work because there are a lot of meaningful differences between organisms in addition to just that sort of proportion of DNA that's shared that are often much more significant in a practical sense. Yeah, so to, to outline a little bit more, basically it's just the letters they're comparing. So if you have, well, let's say you're reading a book and you have seven paragraphs that are the same paragraph, that would count as one difference versus counting as thousands or hundreds of thousands of differences. It, uh, it's a little, a little bit sneaky in terms of how they explain that and stuff. And I imagine a lot of it is headlines with journalists as well. Do you think, do you think the media is a big problem with uh, the distrust of science lately? It's a good question. Um, I would say mostly n not. I think that a lot of distrust of science comes from this same idea that I was referring to of wanting to close our eyes and not believe that there's this um, cliff that people who who have you know who ha everyone has their agenda like we talked about earlier, but the the important or the, their preference of how they think the world works or how they think it should work. And the important thing is to, to 
tr to be open to changing that when there is data or, or personal experience that um, suggests that the way that you look at it may not actually be how it is. Because there is, I believe there is some, some fundamental way that the world works. Um, and so I think a lot of the distrust of science comes from sort of these, um, think these ideas that have been termed tribal where because the people who are like me don't don't believe in it i'm not going to believe in it either and you can see that from the right with the right with um distrust of the idea that climate change is real and a thing that we need to deal with to the left where people who don't want to get their kids vaccinated because their neighbors are not getting their kids vaccinated and they think it doesn't doesn't really matter um i think that the media is a term that is a very uh, big bucket. Um, and if you think about the media as mediating um, scientific discovery and knowledge and public understanding, then of course the media is involved in it. Um, and we do a lot of, the media does a lot of um, poor representation uh, or inaccurate representation of how science works or how, like we were talking about with the, um, with the way that um, different types of findings are represented, like the chimps um, and the DNA, they they can distort the um, it's clickbait. Yeah, and so there is there is a an issue where the the more sensationalized things do get more views, even if they're not necessarily accurate, and that's a that's a problem about common understanding of everything not just understanding of science in particular and i think you could summarize the, the issue facing the united states at the moment and, and perhaps large parts of the world at the moment is due to different sets of facts that people are using and some of those are more more factual if you will than others but if i'm using a, a set of facts that are not actually accurate but I think they are, or I want to believe they are, I'm going to come to a very different conclusion. Is there any good way to address that? Just education? And how do we, how do we overhaul that? You want me to solve the, uh, I want you to solve everything right yeah. here. And now just the, the whole point of the podcast is to get smart people on and they do their best at addressing issues. They're not going to do it right. They're going to be completely wrong, but it's going to be weirdly spontaneous in terms of what you think of and what listeners think of and that will trigger things that are possibly very beneficial for society yeah so with respect to how to address this i think within the scientific enterprise there are there are ways to to improve it i think you know there's something called the rec replicability crisis um where that started in psychology and has since sort of brought in some questions about whether statistics or whether p-values in general are an effective way to um, determine whether something is is the case um, where, and I've experienced this myself subconsciously, I'm sure, where I was doing research and because I hadn't told anyone externally that could hold me accountable to what I'd originally intended to research, I could keep looking until I found a result. And if, if every researcher does that, then they're more likely to find things that they, um, that may or may not be real because they're looking until they find something and they stop. It's just like, you're, you're going to find something in the last place you look because you stop looking once you find the thing. And so there's that issue. And there's also the concept of, um, you know, journals publish positive findings they don't publish null findings and so if i have a drug that you know might do something positive for the world and or you know some some chemical substance or whatever it is and i do research on it and i find that it doesn't do anything i'm less likely to publish that because it's not sensational or interesting and that's a that's something that you could say that that journals also suffer from academic journals in the same way that media suffers from it and I think it comes down to the way that humans work that is slightly different than the way science um, works at its best, where it's really important to know that nine out of the 10 studies about the substance found that it didn't work. And then we can probably ignore the one that said it works 
as a fluke rather than if we only publish the one that says it works, then we think it works. So well, there, there's one way to try to address this within the scientific research enterprise, which is I think called, uh, well, I can't exactly remember the full name of it, um, where you, it may be preprints, um, but it, it's basically where you register your um, study design and your hypotheses ahead of time online in a publicly viewable database. And then you are basically stuck with that design and someone, and you, if you find the thing being a positive result, then you've concluded that your um, results are valid. And if you find that it's not, you're, you can't necessarily change what you're trying to do. Um, and then you can sort of register that there is this result that you didn't, you found a null result. And so it's, to some degree, it works the same way as like public accountability for like New Year's resolutions, where if I don't tell anyone about my New Year's resolution, I can change it. Um, and I, I might be more likely to change it. So that's an answer that is within the scientific community. I think this, the, the answer to this broader question of how do we solve this is to try to figure out how to interact with and have conversations with and listen to, listen across difference, whether that's political or ideological in a different way or racial or geographic, we need to, you know, we need to be able to talk with and view other people as human and as valid and as having their beliefs coming from a place that has value, even if it's different from our own. And that that's hard to do when lots of the uh, information and companies that are mediating the way that we interact with information and with each other are doing their best to channelize us. Um, I think that's a really hard thing. Um, but I think there are a lot of really there are a lot of really good ways to do that. There are conversations. There's meetups. There's talking to random strangers. There's you know a lot of ways to interact with people who are different than us. Um, and I think as as a person, I'm stuck within my own head. As a person, you're stuck within your own head. As a person, everybody is. And so the more that we can interact with people who are different from us, the more we realize that there are things that are unique to us and there are things that are shared to us, excuse me, shared between people. Um, and then there are those things that are different and that we need to figure out how to come to a consensus or a place of agreement with those differences um, in order to be able to function as a society. I think it's really well said. I think it's hard because evolutionarily we're wired to not do that at all. If we see someone on the outside, they're danger and we avoid them or kill them. But I think we have to be able to get beyond our evolutionary tendencies to succeed and thrive in the coming era. That's certainly what it feels like. It feels yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, the scale of the issues that, the, the scale of our species at this point, and probably, you know, for the last hundred or more years ha or, or, or beyond has been such that it is beyond what we evolved to have our, um, have the best capacity to deal with. And so that's where learning and knowledge and communication about how to check our instinctual or gut reactions comes really into play because we can say, oh, it's really important to do these nine research studies because then we'll actually understand rather than if we just saw this one and then ran with it like we would have, you know, 100,000 or 10,000 10, years ago. Um, and it also helps us think about um, the fact that, and this is something I believe, that you are just as valid, as important as a human being as I am. And someone in Pakistan is just as important as you are and as I am, even though I don't know them and won't see them. And so this question of what is my obligation to them in the world, and that's where um, that's where this, it's a very, you know, visceral in, sort of instance of this, you know, tribal or local, local relationship where I'm much more likely to save a person who, you know, falls into a river if I'm there seeing them, but I'm much less likely to save someone in a river from far away 
or to save 10,000 people from a river because they're far away and out of sight and out of mind. And that's still 10,000 people. And the fact that they're far away doesn't, doesn't delegitimize them. It just makes them harder for me to, to empathize with. And I think that it's important to try to build, build that empathy and nobody can care for everybody in the world as we care for the, the most loved ones in our lives. But I think working on building that sense of shared participation in this thing that is called humanity um, brings humanity. I think psychedelics in VR could probably help with both of those. At least that's, that's the, that's what I've been hearing is yeah. that's kind of the experience you have with oneness. And if you're in VR and you're experiencing what someone else experiences, it's hard to think of someone as totally different once you've, walked a mile in the shoes, so to speak. Right, right, totally. Yeah, that could be very effective. I got two last questions for you, Alex. Yeah. First one, what technology are you most worried or scared of? Oh. <laughs> and why? There are so many ways to answer this question. So I'm not a technologist or a futurist in probably the same way that a lot of the folks you interview on here are. So I don't feel like I have a particularly informed answer to this question. Um, I think that the technology that I am most scared of that also has the most potential for good is, and I know it's not a tech, not exactly a technology, but information. I think it's, it is a concept that whether it's misinformation or whether it's accurate information has the most potential to change the way that we relate to each other and change the way that we relate to the world. And, um, you know, so maybe that comes down to the information disseminating devices that we have, um, like YouTube or like Hangouts on Air or like podcasts. Um, that's the one that sort of, you know, it's not it's not guns or AI or you know self driving cars, but I think it, it's the fundamental thing that, to a degree, underlies all of those is how do we how do we manage this onslaught of information about our private lives, about each other, about other other nations, about other planets in a way that is um, safe, hard to steal, and that we use to increase the quality of life for people and the way that we interact with non, you know, non people or the rest of the planet. That's a really good and unconventional answer. Information is power. And I, I like that one. What if you have to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. What would it be and why? Yeah. Align your life with your values. So that means do work you believe in for a purpose you believe in that aligns with, with where you're coming from. And that way, even if it doesn't succeed in the way you define the success, you can say, I did work that I believed in. I learned things from it and I can continue to improve. And I think that's way better than saying, you know, this is a big problem that I don't know how to solve. And so I'm not going to try. Um, and I think it also living, trying to live in this way where your life is aligned with your values also reduces internal dissonance and makes you feel better. So like, if you feel bad about climate change, do something about it and you'll start to feel a little bit better. If you feel bad about inequality, do something about it and you'll start to feel a little bit better. If you feel bad about your job, do something about it. You'll feel a little bit better. If you have a great idea of any sort that you think could change the world, but you're sitting on it because you haven't figured out everything about it and you're not sure if it could work, do something about it. You'll feel a little better and you might actually do something amazing in the world. So I'm not perfect at doing this myself by any means, but it's something that even though I'm not perfect that I try to, um, I try to work on because that's better than not trying. So 
aligning your life with your values is is the idea. None of us are perfect at it. It's a good, uh, you're in good company. Gandhi yeah. says something very similar. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming on today, Alex. It's yeah. been a lot of fun. Where's the best place for people to learn more about you and what you do? Uh, well, thank you for having me. It's been a fun conversation. Um, you could look me up on Twitter if you want, but I don't use it particularly much. That's Alex H. Reich, A-L-E-X-H-R-E-I-C-H. Um, or you could look up uh, Minute Earth on YouTube. That's a place that I share very polished thoughts that have been polished and created with a group of ten, five or 10 amazing people. Um, and you can also look on Hot Mess on YouTube and that's a similar group of five or 10 really impressive people trying to, trying to align the way we live with the way we believe. It's a good way to do it. We'll have links and all that in the show notes, guys. Fringe.fm, make sure you check it out and check out the videos. There's some pretty good stuff on there. Thanks for coming on today, Alex. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Cheers. And until next time, guys, go do something and be that change. Peace.